Hi, everyone. So to launch our exploration of Fourier analysis of periodic functions and later of pretty much any function, we need to start with an investigation of what it even means for a function to be periodic. And then once we know something about periodic functions, we're going to look at the examples of sine and cosine and how those can be used to build up more complex periodic functions. So the first thing that we should say is, what, what does it mean for a function to be periodic? The picture you probably have in your head is something like this. So you've got a function, and then whatever it does, it repeats. So there's an example of a periodic function that is discontinuous because it repeats itself. And every time a function repeats itself, we call that a cycle of the function. And the length from the beginning of a cycle to the end of a cycle is called the period. So the period is the difference in the x values or t values that tell you how long it takes a function to go through one period. And you shouldn't think that the period has to be set the way I set it from beginning to end. It's also possible that as long as you keep the length the same, so say if that period was of length, I don't know, p, then as long as I put a length p anywhere down inside of a periodic function, I still get a repetition. So if I said, OK, well, I'll, what if I look from here to here, and that's still length p, well, I still get a function that's broken up into cycles. The cycles look different, but the period is the same, and the function still repeats itself. OK? So more typical examples we work with are sinusoids, which just means sines and cosines, right? And those are functions that look like this. So maybe this is y is equal to the sine of x. So the distance from the center of the sinusoid to the peak of the sinusoid is called the amplitude. As we said before, the difference between, uh, or the length of one cycle of the function, this is the period. And in the case of the sine, the amplitude of the basic sine function is 1, and the period is 2 pi. There's one more related concept that we use when we're talking about uh, sinusoids in particular, and that is frequency. And the basic thing that you learn about frequency is that frequency is equal to 1 over period. And you can think about frequency as measuring how many cycles a function goes through in a unit time. When we're studying periodic functions generally, we want to take the ideas of sort of sinusoids and then build them up so we can apply them more broadly to say sums of sinusoids or functions that are periodic but are not sine and cosine. So we're going to make a formal definition for what it means to be uh, periodic. So f is periodic with period t if f of t is equal to f of t plus capital T. And you can set this for all t in the domain. Of f. What we're saying is that if you pick any point t, f of t, so here's t right here, and then you go out to the point t plus capital T, you're going to be at the same height on the curve. And that will be true no matter what your starting point is. So if you started right here and you went forward t units, you would end up right here and you still have the same height. And so no matter where you are in the function, moving forward t units in the input variable is going to get you to the same place in the function. That's what forces the function to repeat itself. And so mathematically, when we say that a function is periodic, this is what we mean, that this rule holds. So part of the problem with the definition, the way I've written it down, is it's not clear if the t is unique. That is, there might be lots of different t's that make a function periodic. And in fact, that's the case, that for a function that is periodic, there will be lots of different values of t that make this relation hold. But what we want typically is the smallest t that makes that true. So the minimum value of 
of t is called the fundamental frequency. I'm sorry, fundamental period. So for example, if you looked at something like the sine of 2x. So the sine of 2x repeats every pi units. Pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and 4 pi. So it's going to be the case that the sine of 2x is equal to the sine of 2x plus pi. Because sliding pi units away gets you the next period or the next cycle of the function. But it's also true that this function repeats every 2 pi units because this brick right here also repeats itself. And so it's also the case that the sine of 2x is equal to the sine of 2x plus 2 pi, and 2x plus 3 pi, and 2x plus 4 pi. In fact, any integer multiple of pi is going to give you a relation that looks like the periodicity relation. So the actual fundamental period of the sine of 2x is pi, because pi is the smallest number that makes this relation hold. So pi. is the fundamental period. But it can be said that this function is periodic of period pi, period 2 pi, period 3 pi, period 4 pi, and so on. Mostly what we're interested in for analysis is thinking about the fundamental period. Okay, And every function that's periodic has a fundamental period. So let's talk a little bit about frequency. So when you learn sines and cosines for the first time, especially in physical settings with simple harmonic oscillators, one of the things you learn is that sine and cosine have frequencies associated with them. And you think about frequency as being equal to the number of cycles per unit time. The problem with frequency is that it's not really a concept that is coherent when you start taking multiple functions and adding them together. So if I wrote down a function that looked like this, f of t is equal to 2 cosine of 2t plus 3 sine of 3t, what would the frequency of this function be? Well, one piece of this function repeats itself every pi units. So this has a t value or a period fundamental value of pi and the second piece repeats itself every 2 pi over 3 units t for this piece is 2 pi over 3 now the period for the combined function that is the time it takes to repeat itself will be whenever multiples of pi and multiples of 2 pi over 3 overlap each other for example uh, when you get to 6 pi the functions actually match, right? You have the cycles land at the same point at 6 pi. So if the functions land at the same point at 6 pi, then the period of the whole function is 6 pi. So the period of this is going to turn out to be 6 pi. But what does it mean to say that f has a frequency? Is it really fair to say frequency in the way we think about it, that f is consists of one oscillating wave at frequency 1 over 6 pi? So we don't usually think about the frequency of a function that is built out of simple functions. We tend to think about frequency as a concept that is associated with basic sinusoids. So it doesn't make sense. To talk about. a frequency of f. It makes sense to talk about the frequency of the pieces of the functions that build up f. Frequency 
is associated with basic sine and cosines. Okay, that's going to be important because one of the things that we want to do in this class is to take functions and pull them apart into pieces that have distinct identifiable frequencies. So if our concern is going to be working with these basic sinusoids, we should actually look and see what a basic sinusoid looks like. And the most generic form of sinusoid that you get when you're working with uh, simple harmonics or in the oscillating systems for mass springs, um, the most basic form of a sinusoid you get, the general form, is f of t is equal to a times the sine of 2 pi nu t plus phi. And all of the pieces here indicate something about the properties of the sine function that you're looking at. So we should be able to name all these pieces. The a corresponds to the amplitude. So what the 2 pi is doing in this general form is just making the frequency of these functions into integers. So that's off to the side that the 2 pi is an adjustment. To make integer frequencies. Which is just going to aid our analysis later. And the new, that multiplier adjusts the frequency. So new for a simple sinusoid is the frequency. Whatever frequency, you, whatever value you stick in there is the frequency of the function. And the phi is called a phase shift. What that does is it slides the sine function left or right, depending on what the phase shift actually happens to be. And this thing right here, this is the general sinusoid. You might think, well, what about the cosine? Or what if I take two of these things and add them together? And it turns out to be the case that when you have a sine and cosine of the same frequency and you add them together, you can always write it in this form. So it's just a fact that hopefully you saw when you did harmonic oscillators that if you have a sine of 2 pi nu t plus b cosine of 2 pi nu t, and you take those two functions and you add them together, what ends up happening is sort of magical, is that those two things added together don't, in, don't come up with a wave where there's bumping going on all over the place, right? These collapse into a single sign with a phase shift. And you can use the arctangent to figure out the phi, and you can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the capital A. So this is a really important idea. is that sums of sines and cosines of the same frequency always resolve into a single sine or cosine just with a phase shift involved. So where are we at? What do we have? Well, we know right now, so just this is after our brief reminder about the way that sines and cosines work and what periodic functions are, now we're actually ready to look at what Joseph Fourier's massive insight was and how sines and cosines end up entering the picture in the framework of differential equations. So I want you to imagine that it's the late 1700s and you're a mathematician or a physicist and this is the problem that you're looking at. You have a metal ring and on that metal ring you have a distribution of heat. So you've got a temperature distribution around the ring. So you can imagine here, I'm going to draw a graph, it kind of looks like this. And what I want you to imagine is that all I'm drawing with this graph, you're supposed to think that's just like if I had a straight line and above it I wrote a distribution that looked like that. Okay, so you think about the circle as somehow being the x-axis. So because the metal ring has a fixed radius r, the only value that I need to know to know where I am on the ring is the angle from the zero angle. So if you told me theta I could tell you where on the circle you were because the radius is fixed. So here's what we have in our toolbox. We know that we can basically describe an entire family of sinusoids just by writing down f of t is equal to a 
sine 2 pi nu t plus v. And generically, that's going to get us basically every sine function of integer frequency. We can change the amplitude, we can change the phase, but that's all of it. So now we know as much as Joseph Foyer did when he started looking at the heat distribution of temperature on a metal ring in the late 1700s. And so to give you an idea of the setup for this problem, imagine that you have a metal ring of fixed radius. So this is radius R. And because the radius is fixed, that means anywhere on the circle is parameterized only by the angle theta. If you tell me theta, then we know exactly where we are. So sitting on the ring is an initial distribution of temperature. And what Foyer wanted to know is, how does that change as time goes on? Whatever the initial distribution of temperature is, as time goes on, I know asymptotically what should happen is the temperature should be constant. The heat spreads it itself out equally. The asymptotic condition should be that the heat is uh, sort of equally distributed. So the question is, one, how do you describe that as a differential equation? And two, how do you write down the solutions to that differential equation? So I'm going to try to draw a temperature a temperature distribution sitting on top of this ring. And you can imagine that it might look something like this. And what I'm trying to do here, what I'm trying to indicate, is that, uh, you know, so this is the metal ring. And I want you to imagine that if instead you plotted this on a straight line instead, that this would be theta is equal to zero, and you would get out to theta is equal to two pi, because that would put you all the way around the circle. And then if you drew the distribution, it would look like this. So this one has a peak at zero, and then it flattens out as you go around the ring. And then as you come back towards the origin, it goes back up again. So these two pictures are supposed to be identical to each other. Now the differential equation that describes the way that the distribution works is called the heat equation. And the heat equation is a partial differential equation because there's more than one variable involved in saying what's happening. You, there's a time variable that tells you what happens as time goes on. And then there's a space variable that tells you how the temperature, if for a fixed time, how that temperature is changing as you go around the ring. And the heat equation in this context looks like this. If you let x equal r theta, then you get the differential equation ut is equal to uxx. It's not really the scope of this course because it's a partial differential equation. But the idea here is that really what you're saying is that change in temperature at a given point with respect to time is equal to the second derivative in the space variable. Some, somehow what that means is that the change in temperature at a given point as time goes on depends on how quickly the change in temperature is happening. So what Foyer realized when he looked at this differential equation was that he was actually looking at a problem that was periodic. Because if you take this graph and you keep going around the circle, what you end up with is repetitions of that initial graph. You haven't added any new information because all you're really doing is just pretending that you're going around and around and around the circle. And so as you do that, as you keep plotting and plotting, you end up with something that looks like a sine function. So Foyer's enormous leap was that maybe Instead of thinking about this problem as something that could be modeled with series, power series, instead, maybe because you have what's called spatial periodic behavior. So Foyer's big insight was that because you have this spatial periodic behavior, and you can look at that graph, and it kind of, I mean, this looks like it, it, it's a sign, right? So if you have this kind of distribution, maybe the best way to describe it would not be with a Taylor series or with an, a more general type of power series, but instead, maybe I can build this thing out of sines and cosines of different frequencies. And that's exactly what he did. So he proposed that the solution to this equation should have the following form. U of x and t should be equal to a sum over all possible integer frequencies of some coefficients that it change with time to control how big or small the functions are, the signs are, times a generic sine function, sine of 2 pi 
n t plus v. So the idea here is I have this situation where I've got a differential equation. And instead of working with a power series, because I have this periodic behavior, in the temperature distribution, if I plot it out, boy, I thought, I, maybe I'll try sines. So sinusoids seem like they might model that. And the magic of this is it turned out to work, that you can not only solve the heat equation by assuming that the solutions are infinite sums of these sines, but you end up being able to work in a massive number of applications with this idea. Signals, control, engineering, vibration, harmonics, uh, oscillating systems in chemical equilibrium, um, astronomy. Like, there's no, there's no end to this. Like, Fourier analysis is enormously powerful. The idea that if a function repeats itself, that you can pull it apart into sines and cosines turns out to be this massively important idea. And this is what we're going to be working on, is trying to understand sums that look like this. It's kind of magical, actually, that all you have to do is just pick the integer frequencies. Because this 2 pi is in here, you're saying that the solution to the heat equation, no matter what the initial distribution of temperature is, can be built up just by looking at the sine of frequency 1 hertz, the sine of frequency 2 hertz, the sine of frequency 3 hertz, and so on forever. And that is pretty striking. And so this is going to be our object of study for the next part of the course is going to be power series is going to be series built out of signs. Now, signs, especially signs with phase shifts in them, are really hard to work with. So we're going to do an algebraic trick that's going to let us slip away from dealing with sines and cosines and work with exponentials instead. But that's going to require that we work with complex numbers because we're going to have to change sines and cosines into exponentials involving complex numbers in order for any of this to be algebraically feasible. What did we do in the lecture today? F is periodic if f of t plus capital T is equal to f of t for all t. And in the context that we're working in, typically t will be from 0 to infinity. So we can just write that. Two, the fundamental period of f is the minimum value of t for which f is periodic. Three, that the, gener the generic sine function of frequency n is given by, so the frequency n sine is a sine of 2 pi n t plus phi. And this function, a sine of 2 pi n t, is called a harmonic because originally these came out of the study of music, right? So it's the harmonic of frequency n. And finally, that our central object of study, so we are going to study series that look like the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n sine of 2 pi n t plus v that we're going to be working with what are called trigonometric series. Because trigonometric series are going to be the tool that we use to model and understand periodic functions. Okay, so there's the introduction. What we're going to do in the next video is we're going to talk about how to take the idea of sines and cosines and move them over into complex numbers to make this algebraically feasible. Because otherwise you have to use all these trig identities that are, I mean, they're, they're beautiful, but they're completely unnecessary for the sort of math that we want to be able to do. We want the computations we're doing to be clear and direct, and working with sines and cosines is not going to allow us to do that. So the very first thing we're going to do is take sine and cosine and move it over so that we can write them down as exponentials with the complex numbers involved. All right, so get started on the work, and I'll talk to you next time.